This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Solstice. We here at the Word of the Week are feeling a little embittered toward winter, as we might have mentioned once or twice over the past few weeks. At first we tried to deal with it diplomatically, but winter just wouldn't let up. And though winter has softened somewhat since it got a stay of execution last week when we got distracted discussing the origin of winter clothing-related idioms, we're not letting it off the hook. Because winter is terrible. Yes, we said it. Winter is terrible. And we're not alone in thinking that. Historically speaking, most cultures that live in a place with a winter, because not everywhere on Earth has the same winter, most cultures on Earth have recognized from time immemorial that winter is pretty much the worst thing to happen to the calendar year. Ancient hunter-gatherers recognized it as a time when game was sparse and exposure would kill you. It was a time of brutal cold, darkness, and starvation. And that's why winter is a time for monsters like the Wendigo. But we already discussed that particular beastie. He got his own episode. Meanwhile, Agrarian societies came to know winter as a thing you had to prepare for, something you had to buckle down and survive, because you sure as heck weren't coaxing any food out of the frozen ground. And that's why winter's often tied pretty directly to death in various myths, legends, and stories. And even when it is tied to other ideas, like purification and renewal, those are usually just to make excuses for why such a terrible thing as winter had to happen year after year. In Western culture, the most iconic tale of winter is, of course, the myth of Hades and Persephone, though the story actually starts with another goddess, Demeter, and also involves Ares and Zeus in some versions. Now, Demeter is an ancient goddess in Greek mythology. She doesn't get a lot of play from authors like Homer, but she was very important to the cultures that predated what we considered to be classical Greece. She wasn't even considered one of the Olympian gods. And that's pretty unfair, because she was Zeus's sister, and sometimes also his lover. Ew. Like Zeus, Demeter was a child of the titans Cronus and Rhea, and she was one of the gods that Cronus swallowed after it was prophesied that one of his kids was going to overthrow him. Along with Hestia, Hera, Hades, Poseidon, and a rock dressed as a baby, she was ultimately freed from her dad's stomach by Zeus but I'm pretty sure we've covered that particular delightful story before. Now, Demeter was important because she was the goddess of lots of things that basically kept civilization going. Health, birth, and marriage, but also agriculture, the harvest, and the bounty of nature. Now, Demeter had a daughter, Persephone, and that's where everything goes wrong. See, Hades, the god of the underworld, caught sight of the beautiful Persephone and instantly fell in love with her and Hades went to his brother Zeus for advice. And Zeus was happy to help his bro because that's what bros do. They helped them kidnap their underage nieces. One day, Demeter was out wandering the world, checking on crops and blessing births and doing the things that goddesses of home, hearth, and harvest do. And she left Persephone with a group of naiads, river spirits, on a play date. And Persephone notices this beautiful aroma coming from a nearby valley. So she sneaks away from the naiads and goes to check it out. Only Persephone's best friend, the naiad Cain, notices her sneaking off and follows her. Persephone finds this beautiful flower, a narcissus, in the middle of this isolated valley, which Zeus had planted there to entice her away from her friends. And when she touches the flower, the ground falls away and a huge chasm opens up and Hades comes galloping out and kidnaps her and drags her to the underworld. And when Cain saw what happened, she cried so hard she melted away until all that was left were her tears, which formed the river Cain. Meanwhile, Hades dragged Persephone away to the underworld. When Demeter comes back to find her daughter, she is quite disgusted to find out she's missing. And the Naiads had no idea where she was because the only Naiad who saw anything decided the best way to help was to cry so hard she became a river. 
Demeter is furious and turns the naiads into terrible, feathery, scaly monsters called harpies. Which just goes to show that you do not want a job as a babysitter for a Greek god's kid, because they won't just dock your pay if you steal from the fridge. They'll probably turn you into a hydra or something. Anyway, Cain eventually washes up Persephone's belt. Unfortunately, that really doesn't tell Demeter anything except that wherever her daughter is, her pants might have come off. And that is probably not very comforting news for a mother. So Demeter stops doing her godly duty and takes on the form of a crazed crone wandering the world with lighted torches looking for her daughter. And finally she meets Hecate, the god of magic. And Hecate suggests she go talk to Helios, the sun god, because he sees pretty much everything that happens, during the day at least. And Helios tells Demeter what happened, and Persephone goes right the hell down to the underworld. Get it? To get her daughter back. Meanwhile, Hades has been trying his damnedest. Get it? Get it? All right, we'll stop. Hades has been trying really hard to get Persephone to love him. And while he did score some early points by starting their first date off by giving her flowers, he also lost several hundred points for the kidnapping and for being the creepy king of the dark and dismal underworld. But he does at least get her to eat something. Specifically, she ate a pomegranate. Well, seeds of a pomegranate. Now here's the problem. In ancient mythology, there are these rules about eating fruit. Specifically, if someone kidnaps you and you eat any fruit they give you, you are bound to the land that bore that fruit. So Persephone eats underworld fruit, and now she's stuck there. And when Demeter finally shows up, Hades explains the situation and says his hands are basically tied. He would love to free Persephone, sure, but he can't now, because rules are rules. And Demeter sort of flips out, understandably. Meanwhile, though, Zeus has noticed a little problem involving a teeny tiny little worldwide famine. See, while Demeter was chasing down her daughter, all of the crops in the world have failed and the ground has turned barren. And Zeus realizes that maybe helping his brother kidnap his niece from the goddess who keeps the entire world fed was a bit of a mistake. So finally he works out a deal. Persephone can leave the underworld as long as she returns for a few months out of every year. And everyone agrees that this is the best solution. Well, Hades and Zeus agree. And eventually, Persephone does actually fall in love with Hades. Once he stops getting dating advice from Zeus that involves kidnapping. So Persephone eventually agrees. The only one who can't deal with it is Demeter. Whenever her daughter, now the queen of the underworld is living with Hades. She goes into a depression, and the world freezes for a few months, and all the plants die. And that, according to the ancient Greeks, is why we have winter. Nowadays, though, we know why we have winter. And it has nothing to do with incestuous kidnapping and supernatural rules about fruit consumption. It's mainly all down to the fact that the Earth just doesn't stand up straight. See, the Earth is basically a big spherical spinning top, right? But the axis of its spin isn't straight up and down compared to where the Sun is. It's tilted. Specifically, it's tilted at an angle of 23 and a half degrees. Which means sometimes the North Pole is pointed slightly toward the Sun. And when that happens, the insolation, which is what scientists call incoming solar radiation, the light from the Sun, the insolation hits the northern half of the Earth more directly. And that means that light doesn't have to travel through too much air to get to the ground. And it's that part that's important. See, we think of the sun's light as the thing that warms the Earth, but it really isn't. I mean, it is, but that's not what warms the air. And it's the temperature of the air that really makes the weather happen. What really happens is that the sunlight pretty much passes through the air. That's why we can see through air. It doesn't block light. But when the light hits the ground, some of it is absorbed and warms the ground, and some of it is reflected. That's why we can't see through the ground, but we can still see the ground. 
When the ground and the ocean warms up, it radiates heat. And that heat is what warms the air. Because while air can't trap light, it can trap heat. But the air does cause a bit of a problem for light. Yes, light passes through the air, but as it passes through the air, some of it is scattered and spread out and diffused. When the northern hemisphere is pointed at the sun, that's not a big deal. The sunlight comes in at a nice direct angle and doesn't have to pass through much of the air. So lots of light hits the ground, gets radiated as heat, and keeps things warm and comfortable. But in the winter, the light is coming at an oblique angle, and that means it has to pass through more air to reach the ground. And that means it gets scattered and loses energy before it hits the ground, and that means less heat is coming off the ground to warm the air. So the weather gets colder. On top of that, because of the axial tilt, when the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun, any given spot on the globe spends less time on the sunward side of the earth and more time in the shadow of the earth every day. That is, the sun rises later and sets earlier, and there are fewer hours of daylight. And this effect is at its height on the solstices. In the northern hemisphere, when the tilt of earth's axis points the north pole in the direction of the sun, that day has the most number of daylight hours of any day of the year. At the equator, it's an even split of 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night. At the North Pole, the split is a bit more extreme, with 24 hours of daylight and zero hours of night. On the winter solstice, in the Northern Hemisphere, it goes the other way. The equator still sees an even split, but the North Pole has zero hours of daylight and 24 hours of night. The angle of the incoming solar radiation sets the overall temperature and climate. That's why the further north and south you go, the colder it generally gets. And the variation between the number of daylight and nighttime hours are what create the seasonal variations. That's why locations on the equator have much less seasonal variation. Those two factors together create seasons and climates. Well, along with a bunch of other stuff like trade winds and Coriolis effects and rain shadows and elevation. But give us a break we can only cover so much in one go. Now the thing is, there are actually a lot of factors that go into the global climate, but a lot of them come down to how much light reaches the ground, how much of it is radiated as heat, and how much heat is absorbed by the air. For example, if the ground were highly reflective, say because it was covered with ice, less light would be re-radiated as heat and thus the world would get cold. And this is what happened during various ice ages. Or rather, that's what happened to keep the Ice Ages cold. As glaciers covered more of the Northern Hemisphere, lots of solar radiation was simply reflected as light, because ice is shiny, and didn't get absorbed and re-radiated as heat. And if the air were to be covered by thick, dense clouds that prevented light from reaching the ground, it would also cause the world to get cold. And that is one theory for the cause of another civilization destroying winter that wouldn't end. It wasn't Demeter hunting for her kidnapped daughter, it was volcanoes. See, as historians reviewed various records from Europe between 1200 and 1500, they noticed that the winters were particularly cold and brutal, the summers were cooler, and the weather was just generally cruel. Various accounts also indicated that ice flows were floating in the Atlantic Ocean, and that glaciers were covering Greenland and parts of Northern Europe. Basically, it seemed like the world was freezing over, and the effects of the so-called Little Ice Age seemed to have hit their peak in the early 1300s, when widespread famine killed millions of people. And the Great Famine had widespread cultural effects across Europe. Civil unrest and faith in various social and political establishments began to spread as people starved. The Roman Catholic Church's hold was weakened over Europe and various heretical movements appeared. There was a renewed interest in paganism, witch hunts, superstitions, and this also might have laid the foundation for the Protestant movement. War became more brutal and desperate, culminating in the fiercely brutal Hundred Years' War that was also the recognized end of the chivalric period, and it's when feudalism fell apart. Crime increased drastically, and whole populations died out. To this day, historians still aren't quite sure what caused the Little Ice Age, though there is no doubt that it happened. And many debate how many of the social and cultural shifts we outlined were really due to the Little Ice Age. But one group of historians noted that, in 1257, 
There was a massive tropical volcanic eruption in Indonesia, which was followed by three more eruptions. These eruptions ejected massive amounts of volcanic ash very high into the air. High altitude winds helped the ash spread like a thin little blanket around the world. Meanwhile, the eruptions also ejected huge quantities of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. Sulfur dioxide, as you might expect, is made of sulfur. And when sulfur meets the water in the air, it turns into sulfuric acid. Both the ash and the sulfuric acid are highly reflective. So when the solar radiation hits them, it is reflected right back out into space. And it never reaches the ground. So the world cools and glaciers form. And we know that happened. Those glaciers are reflective, so they slow down the rewarming of the Earth. So things stayed cool for a long time. And then, in 1452, in Vanuatu, another gigantic volcanic eruption triggered another episode of cooling, preventing the climate from recovering. The point is that nowadays, we know enough to come up with plausible explanations for things like massive winters that last for hundreds of years and kill off millions of people. But ancient people were limited to making stories up about incestuous kidnappings and fruit-based imprisonments and stuff. We don't have to believe that winter is about a nature goddess sulking over her imprisoned daughter, or because her brother threw a dead horse into her sewing circle in a simple spat of sibling rivalry gone a little bit too far. Or maybe it was a domestic disturbance. Or both. It isn't entirely clear. Let's talk about the Shinto gods Amaterasu and Susanoo. According to Japanese Shinto mythology, Amaterasu was the sun goddess. She gave the land light and warmth and hope and all of those nice sunshiny things. Susanoo was a storm god. He was brash, impetuous, and temperamental like you'd expect a storm god to be. But he also brought about change and prevented stagnation. Now, in some versions, as Ama and Susa, as they are sometimes called, and we will continue to call them, out of mercy for our poor put-upon voice performer and producer, you're welcome. Thank you. Ama and Susa were sister and brother in some versions of the myths. In other versions, they were troubled and quarrelsome lovers. But in all the stories, there's a bit of implication of both. And more importantly, they had a pretty intense rivalry going. And it all started because Susa was big and loud and barged around. See, Susa was about to head down to the underworld to visit his mother. But he was afraid of the underworld and wanted some comfort from his sister. Or lover, or whatever. We're going to stick with sister, Ama. But Susa can't go anywhere without making a ruckus. So when he gets up to the heavenly realm where Ama is living, he brings a tremendous thunderstorm and lightning and Amaterasu gets panicked by the storm. She yells at Susano for making so much noise and scaring her, and Susa tries to be polite. He apologizes and explains that he can't help the storm thing because he's a storm god, and he just wanted to visit Amaterasu. But Ama knows Susa is an impulsive troublemaker. He's a bad boy, right? And she's about to send him away. So Susano says the one thing you should never say to your on-again, off-again sister girlfriend to end a fight he says, let's get married and have a bunch of kids. Sort of. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. They end up creating eight kids together, eight godlings. Susano gets very excited and he starts running around talking about how awesome his kids are and how he's going to be a great father and bragging. And Amaterasu gets annoyed and reminds him that they are her kids too and suggests that she didn't even really need Susano anyway. And Susano lost his temper. He smashed all of Amaterasu's rice fields and collapsed her irrigation ditches and spread mud everywhere and pooped in her temples. Yes, seriously. We're not taking sides here. As far as we, who are not Shinto priests, are concerned, both sides had a lot of work to do if they were going to make this relationship work. And when they try to make amends, they only make things worse. And Susano takes Amaterasu's sympathy as patronizing condescension, and he starts to resent her self-control and calm. So he decides he'll do something so shocking that he'll make her lose her temper 
just once, so she'll understand what it's like to basically be the embodiment of crazy weather patterns. So one day, while Amaterasu is hanging out with some of her friends weaving, Susanoo finds a massive horse, flogs it dead and bloody, smashes open the roof of Ama's house, and hurls the bloody horse corpse into the sewing circle. Okay, now we're prepared to take sides. That is a bit much, especially since one of Amaterasu's best friends immediately drops dead from fright. Amaterasu can't take anymore. She does lose control of her emotions, but instead of getting furious, she gets depressed. Really depressed. Like, go find a hidden cave and seal yourself in and cry yourself dry. And that's exactly what she does. The problem is, she's the sun goddess. And this is another Demeter situation happening, because the world goes dark and cold, and evil spirits take advantage of it and start destroying the world. Now, this story goes on for a while. The various godlings and their kids realize the world is going to freeze and get torn apart by demons, and they all hatch various plans that range from sad to hilarious to coax Amaterasu out of her cave. One of them involves a stripper dance. Seriously. But what finally strikes some sense into her is a mirror. See, the gods are making such a ruckus that Amaterasu peeks out of the cave. And when she does, she catches sight of herself in a mirror that was hung there as part of one of the previous plans to coax her out. And she sees herself for the first time in weeks, and what a wreck she has become, and how it all started from her fear of the storm that came with her brother. And she pulls herself together, and gets back to work being the sun goddess. And even though Susanoo is in disgrace with the rest of the gods, Amaterasu sends him her love, and he goes to the underworld and visits his mother. But we digress. Our point in all of this was just to point out that no one wants winter. No one likes winter. It's just something we have to put up with. And whenever winter gets remotely out of control, people freeze, people starve, civilizations collapse, and evil spirits overrun the world. And if we had the power to do so, we'd just go sulk in a cave until it was all over. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by The Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. <laughs>